The ocean is the planet's largest ecosystem regulating the climate and providing life livelihoods for billions, but its health is in danger. And this danger goes beyond what we can see from the coast. So that's why I'm focusing on the open ocean. And this figure is very nice. It shows, uh, it's a scheme showing the main impacts of climate change in the oceans, like ocean warming, stratification, and sea level rise. And it shows this impacts uh, in the main, or some key ecosystems that you can see listed on the top, and also some key ecosystem services. And you can see coral reefs, mangroves, salt marshes, and seagrasses, which really suffer with, uh, especially with warming. And you can also see there uh, the Arctic biota. And in terms of services, we have fisheries, aquaculture, uh, coastal protection, and bivalves, fisheries and aquaculture. And you can see plankton, which is, well, the basis of the food web. Why? So I'll be talking about that today. Uh, so I'll focus this talk on the warming effects uh, in the Arctic biota, fisheries, and plankton. Sorry again, no coral reefs. I had to remove it. Um, so basically, in the open ocean, what happens uh, when you have the warming of the surface is that uh, a stratification is created because of the density gradient, and then all the nutrients that are in deep waters and the phytoplankton, the uh, microalgae in the oceans need to grow, these nutrients, they can't come to the surface ocean where the light is available for uh, photosynthesis. So if the surface ocean warms, there's less nutrients, and then you can say that less phytoplankton will grow, but it's not just that, but that's one thing. And it's very clear when we look at uh, chlorophyll signals, for instance, which is a proxy for phytoplankton. So in this scheme, you can have on, you, you see on the left hand, a uh, uh, normal kind of state of the ocean with slightly warmer surface ocean than on the right, warmer surface ocean with less phytoplankton and less nutrients. Uh, and it's these images show this very clearly. Uh, on the left hand, you have maps of uh, sea surface temperature anomaly. On the top, El Nino situation. On the bottom, La Nina, where the uh, equatorial Pacific is cooler. And then on the right hand side, you have maps of chlorophyll. And the greener it is, the more chlorophyll. So on the top, El Nino, so you can see the equatorial Pacific is more blue. There's no chlorophyll or low chlorophyll. And on the bottom, La Nina, you have more chlorophyll because the water is colder. That means there's more upwelling, there's more nutrients coming to the surface. So we are looking from satellites at sea surface chlorophyll, but the ocean goes deeper. So it's important to keep this in mind. Uh, but that's not the only problem with uh, surface warming in the ocean. Uh, the main problem is that uh, the type of phytoplankton that will grow when the water is stratified is different from the type of phytoplankton that will grow when the water is mixed. Basically, if the surface ocean is warm, you have smaller phytoplankton, they are actually as abundant, even in terms of biomass, as it is uh, when you have high chlorophyll at the surface, but they are distributed over the water column, so you can't really see from the surface. But the main problem is that they are small, so small animals will eat them, and then other small animals will eat those. So you have a much longer food chain. And I want you to keep in mind that every time you go from one trophic level to the next, you lose energy. So the longer the food chain is, the le more energy you lose, the less fish that we eat you have and other animals eat. So keep that in mind. It's going to be important for the rest of the talk. So uh, because of this uh, general ocean warming, these ecosystems that we call, is this the pointer? Yeah. The ocean gyres, which are these ecosystems, they are very warm at the surface, very stratified. They are increasing in area as well. And small phytoplankton is dominant in these ecosystems, whereas large phytoplankton is dominant in upwellings and other ecosystems like polar oceans. Uh, so this increase uh, of 
uh, ecosystem supported by small cells is bad for fisheries. Um, so that's another problem. One third problem, uh, and to, to look at this, we need to put one more variable in the equation, which is time. So the ocean is warming, but that also means that when you have seasonal cycles, the water will become warm earlier in the year and it will become colder later in the year. So you have a longer period where the water is warm in most places. So when that happens, because phytoplankton really depends on this dynamics of cold water, warm water, turbulence, stratification, turbulence to grow. And when you have this uh, seasonal shift, what's happening in most areas or most productive areas of the ocean is that phytoplankton blooms are occurring earlier, especially the spring blooms. So I, I won't talk too much about these plots, but I wanted to keep in mind that if phytoplankton blooms are occurring earlier, the animals that, that will eat the, these blooms need to be there earlier. And for some animals like copepods, they're just there waiting, so it's fine. When, but when we start talking about fishes, which migrate, then it's a problem because, you know, the small fishes may not be there yet when the phytoplankton is blooming. And that means that another animal will, will eat that phytoplankton or zooplankton, or this whole material will sink, which is really bad. And we'll talk about this later. But because of this uh, seasonal shift, uh, there are there's a lot of ecological disruption in many areas of the ocean. This is just an example of uh, South Africa, so the upwelling of the coast of South Africa, where uh, phytoplankton blooms are occurring earlier and earlier, and then zooplankton is kind of following. Fishes are definitely following, and marine mammals and birds and turtles are not coping, basically. So it's a problem over there. And here we're talking about fish. But what, what fish, right? That's a problem too. Uh, here is a more specific example of fish. There are two uh, types of fish, a macro shark on the top and a big eye tuna on the bottom. And this is the east coast of the US. Uh, so these plots on the left show in the y-axis the ear, x, the, sorry, the x-axis the ear, the y-axis, uh, basically the day of the year when a lot of these fishes can be fished in the ocean, right? So what these plots are showing is that they used to be fished later in the ocean. And now they are being fished earlier in the ocean. So that means phytoplankton blooms are occurring earlier and they are there earlier. So they're kind of coping, right? But another thing that's happening as well is that these same fishes are being captured more and more to the north because in the south, this is northern hemisphere, so in the south it's becoming warmer and they're just migrating north. So in these maps you can see the, the cold colors are earlier years, the warm colors are later years, more recent, and the warm colors are more to the north. North, so they were they are being captured uh, more and more to the north every year. This is happening to some species of fish. Other species of, fi of fish are just disappearing, right? Uh, and that means that uh, the fish culture, in terms of consumption, is changing. It needs to because the fish that we used to fish to eat is not there anymore. So we need to eat something else. So this is happening in many areas of the world. And this migration to the poles is also happening in terms of vast ecosystems like mangroves, right? So the mangroves are migrating north. And the uh, seagrass or grasslands, they're migrating north as well, but then they can't go as much. They're collapsing. Uh, kelp forests are kind of collapsing as well. So we have a lot of problems in terms of warming for many ecosystems, uh, including fish. Right, so for some species or some ecosystems even, um, 
they can just move north if it gets warmer in the south. But then at some point, there's no north anymore because you're at the pole, right? So what, what happens? Uh, and that's one of the reasons why uh, polar ecosystems are so affected, especially the Arctic. So the Arctic is warming faster. It's surrounded by land. Um, and also the whole ice dynamics there is governed by sea ice, different from the Antarctic ice, which is continental, right? So this is very important. So what's happening in the Arctic is that the ice is melting, so all the algae that grows under the ice is not going to be there anymore. And animals that eat these algae are not there anymore. And then the big, nice, cute animals like polar bears and seals that eat these animals, they starve. So there were some starvation scenes that were very shocking uh, in some years. And that's, that was because there was no sea ice, there, there was no food, right? Uh, now we know that there is another factor there too, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, but basically, if there's no ice, the type of algae changes. It's not the amount of phytoplankton, but the type. Uh, ice algae are like a mat. They are massive biomass concentrated in clumps. And animals that eat that are different, and they grow really fast. When you don't have the ice, you have light in the water column, then the planktonic phytoplankton will grow. And then copepods will be there and other types of fish will be there. And you have this longer food chain with smaller cells on the bases and um, a lot of loss of energy as well through the food chain, right? So for animals that depend on the ice algae or even the ice habitat like seals and, and polar bears, really bad that it's warming. So there's a loss of biodiversity, starvation, decline in fishes uh, that are traditionally consumed by uh, locals. And there's another problem, which is the intoxication uh, by harmful algal blooms. And I'll talk about this a little bit now because I work with it. Sorry again, that's the tragedy that I wanted to talk about. So harmful algal blooms, uh, they benefit on warming. Most species like str stratified waters to grow. And in the Arctic, it's a big problem because most of the diet of people in there depend on the ocean. They eat ocean food, right? So if there is a toxic bloom there, it will get to people and it becomes a big public health problem. So harmful algal blooms can be formed by algae that produce toxins or by algae that don't produce toxins but harm the, the environment in some way. And we'll talk about this. But in the Arctic, one of the main species that bloom there is Alexandrium catenella, this uh, little guy here. It's ugly. Um, it's a dinoflagellate and it produces a neurotoxin that causes paralysis. So what does that mean? If an animal filters the water full of these guys, and another animal uh, eats uh, this filtering animal, it will be very intoxicated because this toxin accumulates. The good news is that it's metabolized in a couple of days, mostly. So if a bear is intoxicated, it will have a little, you know, star for two days, and then it's gonna be fine. But if a bird is intoxicated, it will die because it's so tiny, it needs, it needs to eat all the time. So there's a lot of uh, massive, uh, deaths of fishes and birds because of these toxins uh, in the Arctic and elsewhere, in Chile as well. We've seen a lot of those things happening in Brazil too. Uh, and it's a major problem in the whole world, not only in the Arctic. So good thing is that when these cells are in the water, they change the color of the water. So we can see it from satellite. This is just an example of an image. This is the Bering Strait. And there's a bloom here, you can see the water is kind of red. This is enhanced color, it's not as red, right? But then we can just use color to create models and estimate the abundance of these uh, harmful algae and at least have a sense of where they are, which is great. And we can do it anywhere. Uh, but these blooms occur, in, especially in coastal areas everywhere in the world. This is another example of a 
a bloom in Rio in 21. This was another dinoflagellate, not toxic. And it may not be a problem if the bloom is there and then if it's diluted somehow, but it may become a problem when these blooms become so vast, they occupy like this huge areas of the ocean. So this is Rio here. This is uh, south of Brazil. Uruguay is around here already, right? So this is a massive bloom and it just started in that one, okay, that occurred in Rio. So it may become a big problem. Uh, and again, this was not a toxic bloom, but the problem is what happens uh, when these blooms die because people, well, animals are not eating it. So I'll just play this video, hopefully. Um, so what you see here is just a massive amount of dead biomass of one of these blooms in Rio. This is the surface ocean. It's not mud. Okay, so it, yeah, the, the boat is sailing and I'm showing this just so you have an idea of what happens to this biomass. It's dead, it's being decomposed by bacteria that respire oxygen. So what happens after this is hypoxia and fish kills, right? So it's a big problem and this is gonna sink and this will go on in deeper waters and you have this increase, even bigger increase in, in oxygen minimum zones. So it may be a big problem it, it, if it increases more and more with the ocean warming. Okay, next. Okay, so to summarize, uh, the effects of the warming surface ocean, uh, it leads to ocean stratification worldwide. And this stratification leads to change in phytoplankton size and species, change in herbivore species, and change in ecosystem structure, uh, creating longer food chains, and then it ends up in loss of living energy, basically. Um, similarly, there is a change in, in phytoplankton phenology or seasonality, a shift in fauna, uh, phenology, or st starvation of some species, and species migration poleward. Um, the warming also leads to ice melt in polar regions, uh, which leads to uh, loss of habitat and starvation, and also changes uh, ecosystem structure. And finally, warming favors harmful algal blooms, which uh, will lead to food intoxication, oxygen depletion, and changing ecosystem structure. And I'm just talking about the open ocean. It gets worse in the coast. So this is just a summary of all the problems that uh, climate change are driving in the oceans. And we only talked about the ones that are marked in red. So yeah, sorry. I really wanted to talk about possible solutions for that. I honestly don't see one right now because we can't really change warming at this point or the effects of warming in the ocean. But if you have any ideas, please share with us. Thank you. Explora más contenidos de tu interés. No olvides suscribirte a nuestro canal. 